Yeah. 
thing that I love about the song it says, Oh, how I love you.
Uh, we would like to know, are there any visitors in the house? Do we have any visitors today? Praise the Lord, and we're all family. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise God. Uh, please uh, 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 take note that the uh, Harvest Center is continuing to provide ministry and distribute food. Uh, if you'd like to be a volunteer, uh, they would love to have you uh, every Thursday uh, from 10 to 11. They distribute food. They also come on other days to prepare, I believe on Tuesday, sometimes on Wednesday. So if you're interested, please uh, contact the office uh, and they will let you know how you can get involved. Praise the name of Amen. the Lord. Please continue to pray for our sick and shut-in. Uh, I think they're listed on the bulletin, in the back of the bulletin. If you can, please give them a call. I know that you would appreciate it. And as Pastor Carol had stated before, she lifted up the prayer. Please pray for the grieving families that have lost loved ones in this racist mass shooting in Buffalo. Please continue to pray for that and also for that community. That community is devastated, okay, by this particular incident. And not only that community, but a number of communities in the country have been uh, terrorized by these mass shootings. Uh, so please continue to pray not only for these communities, but also for us, for our community, and also for this world. And now, we have an opportunity to participate, all of us to participate, in the worship of giving. <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Psalmist David wrote in Psalm 116, What shall I render to the Lord for all of his benefits toward me? I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows now in the presence of all Amen. of his people. Yes. Let us uh, listen to and heed to the word. David said, I'm going to pay my vows now in the presence of all the people. Think about what God has provided for you. All he's asking is one-tenth of what he has given to you in tithes and in offerings. So let's, let's give the Lord what he so richly deserves in tithes and offerings. Lord, we thank you, God, for this opportunity to give back to you what you so richly given back to us in tithes and in offerings. And Lord, I pray, oh God, that you would bless these gifts and may they be used for the advancement and the ministry of this church and the building up of the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us all stand.
Thank you. 
gathered together in your name, you would be here. And so we're here, oh God, and we know that you are here. We just want you to just do what you know is best. Make us, mold us, don't let us be here like we came, oh God. Give us what we need in order to go out and, and live our lives effectively for thee. If we will ever be so mindful, give you all the praise and the glory. Take now these words and make them thine. Let your voice be heard and not mine. We ask it all in your son's name we pray. Let the people of God say amen, amen, and amen. amen. When you back up a few verses prior to our primary text, what you will find is the pretext that puts the primary text in its proper context. Starting back in verse 16, Genesis chapter 28, where the Bible says, when Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place. I am in the text. Please keep your Bibles open so you can read along with me. And surely, he said, the Lord is in this place. And I was not aware. Verse 17, he, the Bible says he was afraid. And he said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and it is the gate of heaven. And, and the Bible says, soon after Jacob had spoken these words, look at verse 18, early the next morning, Jacob took the stone that had been his pillow, and then, look, set it up as a pillar, and then took oil and poured on it, consecrated it, if you will, as a monument to God. Verse 19 says, he called the place Bethel, which means in Hebrew, the house of God. <laughs> Listen, it was here at Bethel in the house of God. Don't miss this. In the house of God is where Jacob uttered this promise. It was the house of God. It, 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 it was where Jacob made a voluntary vow. Look at verse 20 once again. It says, then Jacob made a vow saying, if God would be with me, if God would watch over me on this journey I'm taking, if God would give me food to eat and clothes to wear, raiment, some of your translations say, to put on my back, verse 21, so that I can come again to my father's house safely and peaceably to my father's house. Look, Jacob said, in peace. Hold up right there now. This is where you don't want to read too fast because you'll miss the family drama that is contained in this context today. And, and, and if you got your Bible, look at it. I wanted to give you a flashback moment. Look at it. So, you see, most of us are aware of why Jacob says in verse 20, come back to his father's house in peace. Because the Bible says Jacob left his daddy's house in pain and in peril. Look, now flip back. Are you there? Chapter 27, verse 41. Look at it. Chapter 27, verse 41. This is where Jacob, look, remember, Jacob had already tricked his brother Esau into getting his birthright, and then Jacob tricked his daddy into giving him Esau's blessing. Verse 41 says that Jacob's brother Esau held a grudge against Jacob, but keep reading in that same verse 41, it says that Esau was just buying his time, waiting for his daddy's demise. Look at it, waiting on his daddy to die so that he could get even. Verse 41, I'm not making this up. Esau wanted to kill his own brother Jacob for having tricked his daddy into giving him Esau's blessing. Esau was walking around enraged and outraged. Esau was hotter than cayenne pepper. I said it before, ain't no drama like family drama. Why? Because family drama don't stop. Esau, while waiting for the demise of his daddy, was looking for the opportune time to turn the table on Jacob the trickster and take him out. I'm, I'm coming back to our primary text in just a moment, but, but look at verse 41 closely, if you will. Stay with me. It says that Esau said this to himself. He said it to himself. Now look at it. But apparently, he also said it to someone else, or he said it out loud, or his body language said something. Because in the next verse, verse 42, it says, When Rebecca, their mother, was told about it somehow, some way, in some 
one said something to her about it, and she sent for Jacob, and she told Jacob in verse 43 to get in the wind, huh? Hit the road, Jack, or hit the road, Jacob, and don't you come back, what? No more, no more, no more. What you say? Jacob was on the run because of some family drama that he helped to create and to perpetuate. Now, that's the context into which our primary text is spoken. Look, now come on back to chapter 28, verse 20, where, where, where now we see that Jacob, we know that Jacob is on the run. When in verse 20 it says, Jacob made a vow to God. Look at it. While he was wandering a fugitive far away from home, Jacob made this promise when he was away from the protection and the provisions of his parents. Jacob made a vow when he was at his weakest physically, when he was at his weakest financially and at his weakest emotionally. Verse 20 says, Jacob made a vow when he didn't have food on his table, when he didn't have clothes on his back, when he didn't have shoes on his feet. Jacob didn't have a dime to his name as the southern country. Jacob was broken and broke with his back up against the wall. He was at the bottom of the bottom. Jacob made this vow and he was in a no-win situation with a no way out. And now Jacob wants to now start making promises to God. Jacob wants to start making vows to God. And if you ask me, Jacob was a card-carrying member of the If Promises Club. Y'all know anybody like that? Don't, don't say that. Don't say that. Don't even look at your name. Folk who make what I call a voluntary vow. Look at your name and I say to them, say, a voluntary vow. <laughs> you, know, you know, we make all kinds of vows to God, don't we? Uh oh, can I buy an amen? We, we say, we, we, not y'all, but we know folk who say, Lord, if you just get me out of this mess I'm in, I promise to serve you to the what? To the day I. God, Lord, if you just get me off of this sick bed, I, I'll give my life to you. Lord, if you just get me out of this debt that I am, that I'm in, I promise to be a better steward with my resources. Lord, if you would just send me my wife back. Okay, since I'm an equal opportunity to preach. Lord, if you just send me my husband back up uh, for all my sins. Lord, if you just send me somebody, you know, anybody, not, not anybody, but somebody, anybody. Bless me, Lord. What? I'll be satisfied. Look, look, look. At it. And I ain't gonna ever bug you again, God. I ain't gonna ever be begging you again about anything. I wish I could get an amen right about now. Verse, verse 20. I'm in the text. And Jacob said in so many words, Lord, if you will be with me. Lord, if, if, if you would keep me from hurt, harm, and danger. In other words, Lord, if you just keep me out of harm. Way. Lord, if, if, if you give me food to eat so I don't have to worry about when and where my next meal is coming from. Lord, if you just give me clothes on, on my back, if you just watch my back, watch over me while I'm on this journey, strange, stranded, and struggle. If, if you would just do this for me, verse 20 says, while I'm on this pilgrim's journey, verse 21, Jacob said, I'll serve you and you only will be my God. I'm in the text, and what's so surprising about this vow, look at it, is the fact that it was a voluntary vow. Now, Jacob utters this vow on his own volition. Look at it. Please notice God didn't corner Jacob into making this vow. God didn't coerce Jacob into making this vow. Neither did God compel Jacob. Look, Jacob made a voluntary vow. Vow. Look at verse 20. Nowhere in this text does it say that God twisted Jacob's arm. Huh? Nowhere in this text does it say God put a bow and arrow to Jacob's head or God tried to bully and rob beat Jacob into making this vow. No, Jacob made this vow on his own recognizes. Now, now I must say that when I spent time in prayer preparation this week, when I first glanced at this text, I must say that I was impressed with Jacob. Hmm? After all, think about it. When he makes his vow, he's a young man. And you love to see what young men, young brothers making this level of commitment to God. You love to see young folk, young folk saying, for God I'll live. And what? For God I will 
down. I mean, really think about it. What, what pastor would love to have a church filled with young folk who have made this vow to God, to give back to God, to give in support of the work of God, to, to vow to give their time, to give up their talents, to give of their treasure in support of the work of God. Think about it. This level of commitment coming from a young man. I'm just, I was just impressed with Jacob, and I just believe that God was also impressed with this voluntary vow that Jacob made. But the thing that I believe disturbed God the most about Jacob, and perhaps it's just coincidental, but I believe it's the same thing that disturbed God the most about us when we make volitional or voluntary vows. And that is when you close the book on chapter 28 and you open the book in chapter 35, what you will see are two things. The first thing you will see is that God has kept his promise. And the second thing you will see is that Jacob has broken his vow. God gets vindicated because God is a promise-keeping God. But however, the Bible says Jacob has vacated his voluntary vow. Now, because I don't want you to take my word, but turn, turn right quick to chapter 35. Turn right quick to chapter 35, Genesis chapter 35. Come with me, please. Don't, 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 don't delay. Look at it. Genesis chapter 35. I love it. When, when we read chapter 28 and move over to chapter 35, please understand that a total of 30 years have passed. 30 years since Jacob made this promise in Bethel. Look, 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 look. Jacob from the time when Jacob was a young man and rested his head on the stone in the middle of the night, 30 years later, Jacob became, became a wealthy man. Jacob had become very, a very powerful person in the region in which he was now living. You can see that God had kept his promise. Jacob, 30 years later, y'all, Jacob is living lavishly in Shechem with a large family. Jacob has 12 boys and one Daughter, Jacob's holdings were very vast. Make no bones about it. The boy was rich. Jacob owned livestock, the Bible said. Jacob's business was, was booming. Well, they didn't have nothing on Jacob. God had been good to Jacob. God had blessed Jacob. God had blessed him beyond belief, beyond his wildest dream. God has kept every promise that he made. And it is disturbing when you read the first three verses of chapter 35 and it's evidently or clearly that Jacob had become comfortable living in Shechem. And I'm sorry, let me say it again. Jacob had become so comfortable and cozy living in Shechem that he forgot about the vow he made in Bethel. Verse 1 says, Jacob forgot about the vow he made to God when he was running from the wrath of his brother Esau. Look at it. I'm in the text. Jacob forgot to return to the spot of his vow after that heavenly visitation. Jacob, while living in a lap of luxury, forgot about the vow that he made to labor in the vineyard of the Lord. Jacob forgot about how he pledged to give back to God in response to the way in which God had given to him in verse 1 of chapter 35 is the revelation or the indication, might I say, that Jacob had forgot about the vow he made to build an altar to the Lord in Bethel because he had got wrapped up in his wealth in Shechem. And, and how easy it is to forget the promises we make. And this is from the pulpit all the way to the last pew. How easy it is to forget the vow we make when we're searching and scared now that we're living in the security of Shechem. I, I love it. How easy it is and comfortable to get accustomed to the good times of Shechem that we forget about the vows we made during the bad times at Bethel. How, how easy it is on Sunday to, to sit in the comforts of our home and forget about the God who makes life living Sunday through Monday. Now that's what been saying that. I, I need you to just step a little closer to the text as I hurry on. Let me show you some other lessons that the Lord showed me as, as we glean from this narrative. Look, the, the obvious takeaway from this text, and I'm going to hurry on. Look at the obvious takeaway. This is just a footnote. Come on, say footnote. Verse 1, verse 1 teaches that our memories are short, but God's memory is long. 
Somebody missed that nudge today, but wake them up. Tell them, wake up, wake up. He just said something important. Tell them, say, our memories are short, but God's memory is long. Oh, see, I can't remember stuff I said last week. That boy last month. Some of us can't remember stuff we, we said or did last night. Hello. But look at this text. Look at this text. God is reminding Jacob about a vow he made 30 years ago. Our memories are short, but God's memories what? Long. Look, look at verse 1. God had to remind Jacob about the vow he made in verse 1. Look, God said to Jacob, go up to Bethel and sow there. Dwell there and build an altar there to God who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. That's lesson number one. Lesson number one is the lesson of remembrance. Huh? Jacob needed to be reminded by God about a, about a vow he made to God in Bethel. Jacob had gotten off sinner, and the Bible says that God showed up to put him back on sinner. God says to each of us what he said to Jacob when we get off sinner, when we get away from God, when we get away from the voluntary vows we made to God, that not only is this a time of remembering or reflecting, but God says in this text, lesson number two, that this is also a time for returning. Come on, come on, say remembering. I say returning. Look at verse 1. God tells Jacob to do what? To return to Bethel. I love it. To return to the place of your vow. Uh, and, and Jacob, look at it. <laughs> Jacob, look. God had to remind Jacob just like he has to remind us. Look at what God told him. Arise and go back to Bethel. Huh? Look at it. Arise and go back to the old spiritual landmark. Look at verse 2. This text teaches that. Yes, after engaging in remembering and after engaging or before engaging in returning, there's what I call the in-between lesson in this text. Look at it. And that's lesson number three. That is the lesson of removing. Come on, say remembering. Come on, say, say, say it like you mean. Say remembering, returning. Now say removing. Look at verse two. Jacob had to tell his entire family to remove all the foreign God. Listen, when we forget the promises we make to our God, it's easy to become influenced by some other gods or some strange gods. I'm in the text of some strange ideas, forgotten vows always lead to shady stewardship and distorted discipleship. Verse 2, the foreign gods had invaded and infiltrated Jacob's entire family in Shechem. And the Bible says that after remembering, which is lesson number one, and before returning, which is lesson number two, we ought to engage in lesson number three, the act of removing, removing anything that separates us or stand between our relationship with our God. Huh? And that's anything that stands in between our relationship. We must never, the Bible teaches, become so comfortable in Shechem that we forget about the vows we made in Bethel. We should never get so comfortable that we forget about the home training. Look, Jacob, like many of us, Jacob was raised in a God-fearing family. Jacob was raised with God-fearing parents. And the Bible says Jacob, like many of us, were brought up with, with God-loving parents. This is Abraham's grandson. This, this is Isaac's son. Listen, we were raised in the admonition of God. We were raised to respect the things of God. We were raised to respect the people of God. We were raised to respect the man and woman of God. We were taught to respect the things of the church and we were taught to give to God. We were taught to give with a cheerful heart. The Bible says God loves a what? A cheerful giver. And we need to go back from time to time when we've been taught to be kind to one another, when we've been taught never to look down on one another, only unless we're there to help pick that person up. But listen, there ultimately this text teaches that there's one other final observation that I want to show you, and then I'm to look at verse 1 once again. Look at it right quick, and then I'm to look at this text very carefully and prayerfully. I, I love it. The text is not only about just remembering. This text is not only just about returning or, or removing, but ultimately this text is about what God says in verse 1. Look at it. This text is about the lesson of recommitting. 
I'm in the text, please notice. Jacob was instructed to go back and build an altar to who? What does your Bible say? To God. Go back and build an altar to God. Listen, this ain't about anybody else, Jacob. This volitional vow is between Jacob and God. Look at it. Jacob is instructed to go back, in other words, and build an altar to the one who had brought him through many dangers, toils, and snares. Yes, God is calling Jacob to go back to the place of his first blessing. And God is calling him to go back to the place of his first beginning. Yes, that place where things of God were exciting, things where God were fresh, where you felt the presence and the power of God operating in your life. God told Jacob to go back to that place so that he can remember. It's like the song my ancestors used to sing, take me back, dear Lord. Take me back to the place where I first Receive you. We need to go back and re recommit ourselves to a God look of second chances. I'm in this text. Go back and recommit ourselves to a God of another chance. I'm go back and recommit ourselves to a God who allows you turns. I, I love it. And God demonstrated to Jacob in his dealings what, what that song said. Take me back, dear Lord. And that's what we need to do. Every now and then, we need to go back and recommit ourselves to the God who brought us, huh? The God who brought us from a mighty, mighty long way. And like Jacob, God brought him from nothing to something. We, we need to go back because God brought us from death that goes to new life. He brought us from no confidence to self-confidence. He brought us from the outhouse to the white house. He brought us from bus to, from the back of the bus to home in the book. He brought us, as somebody said, from news to Mercedes. He, Yes. 
Thank you.